mind if you go ahead and turn off any sound. And also, I do want to point out there are museum calendars of events on the table just outside the auditorium. So uh, I definitely encourage you to pick one up on your way out tonight if you didn't already do so on your way in. We do have programming almost every day of the year, which means there's certainly something to interest you and your friends and family. So don't leave tonight without one. And of course, you can always look the events up on our website as well, which is www.mohistory.org. Finally, I do want to make a note about some uh, changes to tonight's program. We had plans to have Joe Rangano here in the building tonight, but unfortunately because of some family medical issues he's dealing with, he was unable to come into St. Louis. We will still hear from him, thanks to modern technology. We're able to Skype him in this evening. So uh, he is going to talk with you about his work, and uh, we'll have some questions from him. And then afterwards, after he pre presents, We'll be joined by Michael Friedlander and Denise Brock, who will also deliver short presentations, and that will be followed by a discussion where you'll have a chance to ask any burning questions that you might have for them. Tying the whole thing together is David Lobig, who is our uh, museum's curator of environmental life, and he will introduce the various presenters and act as a moderator for the panel discussion. So it's going to be to David that I turn over the podium at this time to get us started in earnest. So I thank you again for being here this evening, and please join me in welcoming David Lobick. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, yes, we have a, a really full program, and we want to be sure we can cover it all here tonight, so I want to launch right in. Uh, thank you for coming here this evening. I am David Lobick, who is the, I am the curator of environmental history here at the, at the Missouri History Museum. Uh, my work involves the collection and interpretation of artifacts that convey our region's history of interaction with the um, uh, environment and people, between the environment and people. And uh, the Missouri History Museum, as you might know, was founded in 1866 to collect and preserve our region's history for posterity. We do this for, through our impressive artifact collection, archives, and library, and our exhibits and public programs. We have three panelists, as, as Emily had mentioned, uh, to discuss this unique role of the St. Louis community and how it played an um, uh, essential part in the development of and protection against the hazards of nuclear weapons technology. We're doing this through the lens of the St. Louis Baby 2 survey conducted between 1958 and 1971 by concerned citizens and scientists here. Uh, Joe Mangano, as, as Emily mentioned, uh, can be here because of extenuating circumstances and will dearly miss him uh, in person. But because he's here with us on um, Skype, uh, we're going to try to keep him here through the program and perhaps, uh, be able to, perhaps be able to ask him questions later on after he's presented and the others have given their presentations. <coughs> Afterwards, I'll, I'll moderate the panel discussion uh, with questions from you, and hopefully uh, we'll all get out of here before we uh, have to go to sleep. I, I think that this will all, the pre our presentations will take about an hour. And for the first 15 minutes, though, I want to share with you a very brief background of uh, the period in which the St. Louis Baby 2 survey was developed. I'm doing this through a rapid viewing of images that will hopefully set a tone. Uh, I want to familiarize you, or for some of you, re-familiarize you with some of the relevant people and the um, iconic topics of the period in the Cold World War in this region. The uh, majority of the images used uh, in this presentation are pulled from documents and artifacts in the Missouri History Museum's collections. We'll continue to seek artifacts uh, for our collections that are relevant to this history, uh, so you can see me afterwards if you have any interest in helping me to do this. I'm particularly interested in acquiring them. Uh, one of these uh, buttons, we still haven't uh, acquired one of those, but we do have some baby teeth, uh, thanks to Joe Mike now. Uh, let's begin uh, with, uh, oops, sorry, uh, to use the, there we go. Uh, let's begin with Arthur Holly Compton, he's a professor of physics at Washington University in the early 1920s. His uh, work concentrated on X-rays and cosmic rays, and he was the Nobel, Nobel laureate in physics in 1927, same year that uh, Lindbergh flew over the Atlantic Ocean. Chancellor of Washington University after World War II, uh, took a hiatus in Chicago. Um, he significantly contributed to the development of atomic physics and quantum mechanics. He was perhaps the most prominent individual in our community associated with the development of the atomic bomb, 
For during his time between the physics department chair and chancellor of Washington University, he was a principal of the Manhattan Project in charge of the metallurgical laboratory, as it was called, uh, codenamed, at the University of Chicago, where he worked with Enrico Fermi on the first controlled fission chain reaction. Compton's association with Washington University prompted the use of the campus's cyclotron, an 80-ton atomic particle accelerator to be used for isolating the first plutonium, which was the plutonium used in the first self-sustained nuclear reaction and first atomic bombs. Uh, just the amount that's basically a grain of uh, uh, salt in, in quantity. Uh, here's his identification badge uh, for access to the uh, Hanford, Washington nuclear production site where he had the code name A.H. Uh, Comas. Work at Hanford eventually helped develop so-called nuclear tactical weapons like the nuclear cannon tested here in the Nevada desert in 1952. Compton and others sincerely held that the threat that the Soviet Union posed was to potentially destroy democracy, to enslave the world. Nuclear weapons were seen early on as the ultimate deterrent to attack. As the arm race heated up, the ante was continually increased to develop the most powerful and most terrible weapons. At the beginning of the Cold War, federal, state, and local governments grappled with the threats of the, that these nuclear weapons posed to our nation and the world. Official civil defense information proclaimed what these threats were and how to avoid them. Brochures, pamphlets, and booklets showed where the bombs might likely fall and what areas were in jeopardy. That's St. Louis and St. Louis County. Here's St. Louis and its zones of most likely destruction emanating outward from the core of downtown. Uh, with accent on paths for civilians uh, to take in order to flee the aftermath. They showed how to protect oneself and family from fallout in the most pernicious aspect of destruction. And if read carefully, uh, as you can see here with Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense's statement, um, if they read carefully, a hidden message becomes clear that there was no meaningful avoidance of the terrors of atomic weaponry, and much of our official planning tended toward mere placation. These are the best programs we have. Civilians were encouraged to stockpile supplies in the basement and these sort of uh, essential supplies and build temporary shelters, fallout shelters, which would be largely ineffective for, man for managing the long-term illnesses and secondary effects of exposure to radioactive particulates in fallout. So they did devote a lot of discussion to fallout. Protection from radioactive fallout, it was noted, could, would be needed everywhere. There's a cloud and a graphic, very bold graphic demonstration of fallout coming down. This is farmland down here. So really, uh, farm and farmland doesn't say it either. Literature attempted to describe and simplify the types of radiation exposure and how it would be dispersed through less than predictable weather patterns. So you can see um, uh, some diagrams with the uh, uh, wind from the five megaton yield and, and yeah, a very, very basic graphic here of basically uh, eastern seaboard gone and, and we're out here in the middle. Although this is not a, not a studied uh, specific uh, uh, diagram. Pamphlets and booklets asserted with sincere and direct authority that most radiation was supposed to decay rapidly, so sheltering was essentially mainly, essential mainly in the earliest days and hours. Depending, of course, where the bombs exploded. No one could say for certain where the enemy planned to explode them, uh, such as near the ground, uh, it, it would cause terrible destruction and heat, um, and uh, destruction by uh, shock, or higher in the atmosphere, uh, which uh, maximized the spread of fallout and radiation exposure. Or even if they could be, uh, uh, even if the bombs would explode as planned. Our governments based nearly all of this, their understanding on theory and the results of military testing of our own weapons. And as with all efforts to avoid the terrors of potential war, planning seemed essential, but also seemed in many ways futile. The result of nuclear war appeared to some to present so many new, terrible, and hard to comprehend factors. Amidst all this, the Greater St. Louis Citizens Committee for Nuclear Information was founded in April 15, 18, 1958, excuse me, trying to make it older than it is. April 21st, 1958, uh, to collect and clarify some of the knowledge about the effects of peace, peaceful and military uses of nuclear energy. They sought to stimulate discussion and engender the expression of opinions by an informed citizenry. Numerous physicians, and this is a list of uh, the uh, first committee, uh, research scientists, educators, and concerned citizens came together to provide information on publications, 
a speaker's bureau of qualified experts, and hold meetings about topics requiring public examination and open scientific discussion. Among them were Edna Gelbarn, a prominent St. Louis um, uh, person, and if she put her uh, name and money behind something, it usually happened. Uh, Park J. White, uh, who's a pediatrician at Homer G. Phillips, uh, John Fowler, a physicist at WashU, uh, Dan Boloff, another physicist, Alexander Langs Langsdorf, um, physicist and developer, uh, one of the contributors to the development of the atomic bomb. Um, married to the woman who in invented the doomsday clock, a uh, graphic that, that describes how close we are to, uh, um, to total annihilation. Here a photo from a pet press conference about the Nevada nuclear test site shows Tonight's panelist, Michael Friedlander, right up there, and uh, Barry Commoner, and uh, uh, Charles McIntosh, who I don't know, and Edward Martell, and, and uh, uh, Sheldon Novick, uh, who was later the, or I guess at this time, uh, editor and uh, studied uh, law at Washington University and helped organize uh, the citizen of uh, the CBNS. With these efforts in mind, um, the um, uh, a Committee for Nuclear Information published this monthly bulletin in the late 1950s called Nuclear Information. As I understand, it was run off on a mimeograph uh, in uh, Barry Conner's office. Um, it remained consistent, consistently meaningfully informative and later became a magazine here in the 1960s. Degradation to the environment continued to pace over the years though, um, through increased abilities afforded by technologies developed partly during the emergency of war, first out of the Second World War and then in the Cold War. Uh, CNI then changed its name. It became the Committee for Environmental Information and continued to express concerns about nuclear energy and weapons, as well as other envi environmental issues in uh, this magazine called Science, Scientist and Citizen. This magazine remained published from St. Louis for years. It lives on as a peer-reviewed magazine called Environment, with scientific expertise contributed from out throughout the United States. One of the most significant accomplishments of the committee was the landmark study of the radioactive strontium-90 isotope in teeth. The idea on which the St. Louis Baby Tooth Survey was founded came through a suggestion in 1958 by a biochemist named Herman Kalker, uh, who had arrived in the United States as an exile from war in Europe. He pointed out the <clears throat> that this nuclear fission product, which is not found in nature, could be tested for, for in deciduous baby teeth. It is interesting that during 1939 and 1940, Calker worked in the biochemistry lab of uh, Carl and Gertie Corey here at Washington University and collaborated there with the St. Louis native Sidney Colwick, also a biochemist. Though Calker moved on to Harvard by the 1950s, uh, the relationship developed by individuals in the scientific community and how they influenced each other's ideas about radiation and public policy are interesting to know, I think. In the fall of 1958, so the same year, CNI's Vice President, Dr. Alfred Schwartz, um, who was from the Washington, he was a Washington University professor of uh, clinical pediatrics, brought Calker's idea of an international milk teeth radiation census to CNI, which approved it. Other noteworthy study proponents were Washington University's uh, plant physiology professor, Eric Conner, who I mentioned before, and his wife, Gloria. With similar, with similar interest in the interconnectedness of man-made biological hazards, very common commoner later founded the Center for the Study of the Biological the Study of the Biology of Natural Systems in 1966. For the important first three years of this program, it was headed by Dr. Louise um, Zebel Reese, who was an internist. She solicited families, mainly through area schools, to send in their children's baby teeth for study. Her persuasiveness proved to be very successful, and uh, with the help of her husband, physician Eric Reese, uh, subsequent survey director, Don Logan, Sophie Goodman, Rose Rosenthal, and others, um, the deans of the Washington University Schools of Dentistry and, um, and many area dentists, this program spread widely. Here we see an example of a school distributed card asking for children's uh, names and their parents' names, um, their address, and uh, highlighting an area, um, highlighting an area down here where the uh, tooth could be attached and sent back in. Uh, here on the reverse side of the card, uh, it's calling for how long the child nursed and uh, how long it was uh, with uh, formula, what kinds of formula. These are obscured by a, a rusty paperclip um, print there, but um, uh, other information as to which, uh, which 
tooth it was, and so forth. As our panelists will tell you more about, the program did shed light on human exposure to radiation, radioactive fallout, through weapons testing with over 300,000 teeth collected by its end. The unique the nuclear energy of the St. Louis region is intrinsically involved with the race for atomic weaponry and energy. It lives on in the lives of the workers and their families who were employed in the development of these weapons, such as through Malincra chemical works. The legacy also remains with us in environmental contamination, such as the uh, Westlake landfill site, a repository of much of the Malincra's nuclear waste, and at the de former uh, Department of Defense Ordnance Works at Weldon Spring. The Committee for Nuclear Information was conformed with informing citizens so that, so that they can make the necessary moral and political decisions on these issues, which it implores people to understand down here as they subscribe to Scientist and Citizen. Our panelists will tell you more uh, about the very special CNI program, the St. Louis Baby 2 survey uh, that we have central to this evening. So I'd like to introduce to you now the first panelist. Uh, we're very, very happy to have with us via Skype, Joe McDonald, who is the health researcher and um, executive, excuse me, and um, executive director of the New York-based radiation and, oops, sorry, there we go. Is that Joe? Yeah. Trying to get this. I'm doing the alt tab to get us to Joe. And Did we not get it? No. Were we able to reach him on the phone? Yeah, yeah, he's, he should be. Oh, okay. We should be waiting. Huh. Uh, 
days straight uh, for it. So this is going to be difficult. Um, but my focus will be on the tooth study itself and the impact that it had, not just on St. Louis, but on the entire world. Uh, slide one, please, David. I'm going to start with <coughs> two basic questions. First of all, why was there a tooth study at all? And number two, why St. Louis? Why did it occur in St. Louis? Let's start with the first one. To understand why the baby tooth survey came about, we have to go back to the 1950s. This was the time of the Cold War between the communist world and the anti-communist world, and specifically between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, the, part of the, the worst part of the Cold War was this incredible race frantic race to um, develop large arsenals of nuclear weapons. So there, was, there were hundreds of atomic bombs being tested, and there were thousands of bombs being built as fast as possible. And this was not done for show. Uh, sincerely, many leaders, all military leaders, and a number of political leaders believed that an all-out nuclear war between the two countries was inevitable. It was going to happen, and we had to do the best we could to survive this absolutely catastrophic war. Um, this was um, very disturbing to people. That goes without saying. I mean, the, the idea of, of uh, being blanketed by atomic bombs from the Soviet Union and doing the same was, was horrifying to people. Uh, but as time went on, and people waited for this war, which thankfully never came, uh, people were also concerned about bomb test fallout. When I say fallout, for those who don't know, um, when, a, when atomic bombs were tested in Nevada, above the desert, uh, they would form these very large mushroom clouds, 40,000 feet in the air. And in those mushroom clouds were huge amounts of a hundred different chemicals, not found in nature, but only created when a bomb explodes or a nuclear reactor operates. And the fallout then moved through a prevailing winds across the country and returned to the environment through precipitation, through the rain, where it rained into uh, reservoirs, where public water uh, is, is kept, it rained into um, pastures where milk-giving cows grazed and so on, and it got into the body. So there was a, probably an equal fear. Um, this fallout is, is getting into our bodies, and, and particularly parents were concerned about their young children who are much more susceptible to radiation than others. So there are, are, are the concerns, and uh, people wanted to know how much of this stuff is getting in our bodies. No one knew. The government had a small program uh, of bones, but it was very small, as I said, and also um, the government didn't do very much to publicize it. Now, why St. Louis? Um, very simply, St. Louis in those days was a hotbed for good scientists with strong public concerns. Many of these people worked at Washington University. David, you mentioned some of them. about nuclear war and, and bomb test fallout, but they had certain ideas. They believed that scientists should do more than create a technology. That they had to go further and understand the risks of the technology, such as atomic energy, and to inform people just what those risks are. They also had an idea that um, rather than working by themselves, scientists and citizens working together uh, would be a more effective team in uh, improving public policy. These were, these were uh, new ideas, some considered them radical at the time. Okay, next slide, please. We go to 1958. That was a very critical year. Um, in 1958, these scientists and citizens put together what is known as the Greater St. Louis Committee for Nuclear Information. And one of the first 
things that the committee did was to authorize a study of strontium-90 in baby teeth. Now, what is strontium-90? It is one of the 100 plus chemicals that I described in bomb fallout. It doesn't exist in nature, but only is created when a bomb explodes or a nuclear reactor operates. Um, strontium is a lot like calcium, okay? When someone drinks milk with strontium-90 or, or water or, or consumes food, um, the strontium, the body thinks it's calcium. It quickly goes from the stomach to the bloodstream and attaches to bone and teeth where it remains for a lifetime. Now, of course, calcium promotes health, but strontium-90 is radioactive and it is destructive to health. Strontium-90 um, immediately uh, attacks cells, where it either kills cells or it impairs them, which could lead to cancer, could lead to birth defects, and could lead to other diseases, especially in children. Um, it, was, it was a brilliant idea, really, because any other way to measure radiation in human bodies um, was kind of difficult or invasive. It often involved autopsies or biopsies or blood or urine samples. This was an easy and fun way to find out how much was in the body. A child loses a baby tooth and all that people have to do is to ask for the, uh, the tooth to be donated where, where it could be tested in a lab. So not only was it easy, but it also gave citizens in St. Louis and, and elsewhere as well um, a, a sense of purpose, a sense that they, just by the simple act of donating to, were really contributing to science. Okay, during the next 12 years, uh, the, the city of St. Louis and the St. Louis area went through an um, amazing experience where um, mostly volunteers furiously went out and collected baby teeth. They collected them from libraries, from schools, from churches, from dentists, from rotary clubs and lions clubs. They got media coverage about it. They went to politicians. They got the mayor to declare a baby tooth week. They went at it. And it's just almost hard for me to, to say, but about 320,000 baby teeth I'll repeat that, 320,000 baby teeth were collected in that 12-year period. This was, this was such an a incredible um, effort, civic effort, that even decades later, many, many thousands of people in St. Louis, or those who have moved away, still recall it very fondly. I've had a number of either phone calls or letters or emails saying, I remember um, when I gave my tooth, and David, I think you showed it. Um, let's see. Well, anyway, the, uh, the button that um, w was given to, there we go, to baby tooth donors, with a picture of a little boy with a gap in his teeth saying, I gave my tooth to science. People still remember that. Okay, the, then what happened to the teeth? They were sent to a specialty lab, and tested for strontium-90. The results were astounding. From 1950 to 1963, they found that the average strontium-90 levels went up 50 times. Not 50%, 50 times, which is about 5,000% as the bomb testing went on and on. This confirmed people's worst fears. Uh, the researchers in St. Louis put together a medical journal article. It came out in late 1961, and it was sent to the White House science advisor, Jerome Wiesner. And Dr. Wiesner took the article and sat with President John F. Kennedy and discussed it. Kennedy had been becoming um, more and more concerned about not just nuclear war, but bomb test fallout. And in one of the books written about Kennedy, one of the first books after 
his death was by Theodore Sorensen, and it describes a meeting between Dr. Wiesner and Kennedy. And um, Dr. Wiesner said, was, was explaining to Kennedy that how the fallout would come back to Earth with precipitation. And it was a rainy day in Washington, and Kennedy looked outside his window and pointed and said, do you mean it's in the rain out there? And, and Wiesner said yes. And Wiesner recalled that for the next several minutes, Kennedy grew silent and looked out the window with, with a very somber look on his face. This information really got to him. And not long after, August 5, 1963, the United States, Soviet Union, and Great Britain agreed on a treaty to stop all above ground atomic tests. And as you can tell by the date, on August 5th, which is Monday, will mark exactly 50 years to the day that this was agreed to. The Senate easily ratified it, and Kennedy signed the treaty just six weeks before he was killed. Um, after the treaty, the baby tooth study went on. In fact, this, this may have been one, one of the greater parts of the study. Uh, the researchers found that in the five years after the test ban treaty, strontium-90 baby teeth fell by more than half, by more than 50%. This was a huge drop in fallout in a, a few, just a few years. And I believe, and I think a, a number of people agree, that means by getting this fallout out of people's body, this treaty probably saved thousands of lives, perhaps even millions of lives. And the St. Louis II study was a factor, maybe a major factor, in getting the treaty. Okay, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> the study ended in 1970, although it never really ended. Um, first of all, it became a model for future studies. People understood uh, about uh, giving, using baby teeth as a, as a, a much easier way to um, measure in-body radiation. There were a number of studies in Europe uh, of the same thing St. Louis did, uh, of bomb test fallout with the same findings as testing went up, strontium went up, and after the tests were banned, the strontium went down. There were several studies done uh, comparing teeth before and after the Chernobyl nuclear accident in 1986. Then in the late 1990s, the Radiation and Public Health Project Research Group which is the group I work for, um, began a study of strontium-90 baby teeth near nuclear reactors in the U.S. And I was fortunate enough to speak to a number of the original um, leaders of, of the St. Louis study, and they, they helped me quite a bit in putting ours together. We found highest levels uh, were in, are closest to the reactors, that the averages we're going up over time, and also we found the link with childhood cancer. The trends in strontium-90 and T were the same as trends in local childhood cancer. Then there was a study in England as well. Uh, so it's, it's become duplicated many times over. You can go to the next slide now. The, the big news, though, with the St. Louis study um, came in 2001. In June of that year, Washington University officials were at the Tyson Valley, uh, in Tyson Valley, where they had storage units. And they were, they were simply looking for storage. And they came upon boxes and boxes and boxes, about 250 long shoe boxes of baby teeth that had not been used in the original study. Nobody, nobody knew this. This was a, a complete shock to everybody. We estimate about 85,000 of these teeth are, are still around. Each tooth is enclosed in a small envelope um, that's paper clip. You can see the paper clip is, is rather rusty because they've been in these uh, storage areas for years. A paper clip to a card that 
has information on the tooth donor, on the tooth donor's parents, and on the uh, tooth itself. So this is really a, a gold mine for research. The university donated the teeth to us, and our plan for the teeth was something that wasn't done in the original study, and that was to address the question, how much did fallout harm people? Did it actually cause a, a rise in cancer? Was it a risk factor for cancer? We, we know it went up you know, greatly during testing, but, but did it harm people? Um, the response, the public response to the discovery was incredible. The Post Dispatch did a, a story on the discovery, and um, it, it got national coverage. You know, the AP, the Associated Press picked it up. New York Times, USA Today, National Public Radio—they all did stories on this this revival of the baby tooth study. Um, I uh, unwittingly. Um, allowed the paper to put my address and email into the <laughs> article. Sure enough, I was bombarded by over 2,000 emails and letters, mostly from children, baby boomers, um, who had given baby teeth. Some were from their parents. Uh, and all of them were, were very supportive. Some were nostalgic. Yes, I remember the tooth study. I remember the button. But a number of hundreds of them had stories about health. Things like, I've had thyroid cancer since I was 40 years old. Doctors can't tell me any, if I have any risk factors for it. I've always wondered if fallout had health causes. You know, or, or my wife died of, of leukemia at age 37. I'm, I'm wondering if fallout played a role in it. You know, we, we, su we support uh, any study that can identify even one factor. So um, we, we took it upon ourselves to find a sample of tooth donors, again, now in the, mostly in their 50s. We, we looked for 4,000 of them, and we, we found a number of them, um, either at current addresses or in death records from those who are deceased. Um, we found and, and published an article in a medical journal in 2010 that uh, strontium-90 baby teeth for people who died of cancer before age 50 was more than double that of people who were healthy by age 50. Okay, 122% higher. This was just the first study where we are planning more, uh, but it does uh, support the idea that a, that bomb fall, in fact, was harmful to people, especially uh, children who, who were exposed to. You can go to the next slide now. In conclusion, um, I'm going to address how how should history view the baby tooth survey? You know, what, what, what did it actually do? And I have four, I believe four, four things should are worthy of mention. Number one, and number one by a mile, is this tooth study sped the passage of the test ban treaty. It sped the end of above ground bomb testing, which dropped this dangerous fallout in bodies by, by a huge amount, and once again, probably saved thousands, even millions of lives worldwide. In addition, it established a, a relatively uh, simple method for testing radiation in bodies, one that's been redone again and again. Number three, um, it, it really proved that scientists and citizens working together can be an effective team. Um, this is not typically done. Scientists do most of the work them, themselves. Um, but, but put together, it can be a, a very strong and effective uh, method, not just of doing science, but taking it into the policy arena. And finally, it, it backed up the belief by many of the Washington University scientists that scientists have an obligation to do more than just create technology. They have to find out what, if there are any risks to this technology. They have to 
bring this information to the public so the public understands the, these risks and then to take it to the policy arena. Well, th that is it for me. I've left out many, many details and many, many names of, of terrific people that did incredible work on this study. What I can suggest to you is several things. You can pick up one of the handouts that's available to you tonight. Um, several years ago, I wrote a book. It's called Radioactive Baby Teeth, The Cancer Link. It's very easy reading. I devoted three or four chapters to the St. Louis study, and you can uh, purchase it on Amazon. And then finally, you could uh, contact me through our website, which is www.radiation.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we're going to minimize you, I think, and uh, <laughs> hope it doesn't hurt. Um, um, I guess I'll, I'll get rid of the image and you'll have him still online, is that right? Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, we're going to have him around uh, for some audio later if we can manage the technology, and or if I can. And um, maybe you have the wrong person up here at the, at the podium, but I hope I can do that and we can have him for questions later if, uh, if, if, uh, if I can convey those questions for him. Um, also with us tonight, uh, very important in our panel discussion, is Michael Friedlander. He's Emeritus Professor of Physics at Washington University and joined the faculty of the Department of Physics in 1956. He was there uh, until 1999 when he retired. His research area covered cosmic rays and related infrared, infrared astronomy. His earlier experimental work related to the properties of the strange particles produced in the collision of high energy cosmic rays, um, cosmic ray particles, excuse me. Uh, Friedlander is also interested in the interface between science and society and the structure of science. He has taught courses in the history of science and the contrast between science and pseudoscience and is the author of five books. <coughs> he has served as consultant to the Encyclopedia Britannica and contributed several articles. He has been a national vice president and council member of the American Association of University Professors and has been active in faculty affairs serving on numerous committees, including terms as chairman of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Faculty of Council, and chairman of the University Senate Council. He was a member of the St. Louis Committee for Nuclear Information where his special interest was the national program for the use of nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes. Please welcome Michael Friedman. Also is part of the fallout, 
And that, when it gets into the body, tends to go the side way. So one is concerned for the possible effects of that. So a lot of this was the background for Fowler and Waterbauer. Um, interesting enough, both of your papers, a strong social conscience, um, feeling that scientists did, as Joe had commented, they did have a social role to play. There were things to do. This, in fact, is an echo of what one found in C.P. Snow's books. C.P. Snow is known for the particular for the book, the V Lectures in Cambridge. The V Lectures given in 59, the book came out, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, but not as well known as the book called Science and Government. And then the second edition, Science and Government. Can you turn off the microphone so we can hear you a little better? Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. I'm sure how to do this when I'm sitting further back. C.P. Snow drew attention to this in the book Science and Government when he pointed out that major decisions, political decisions, were made by people who had not the slightest understanding of the science and technology involved in it. I think Fowler and Bauer felt that way, excuse me, too. And so they were going around and giving these lectures. And Ed Stevenson, in the 1956 election campaign, also raised the issue of fallout. Um, what was it? Where was it going? And who needed it anyway? And so the issue was a Cold War issue. The dimension of the Cold War, people forget about this. Anybody suspected of being supportive of the Soviet Union or critical of the United States government was suspected. Were you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? People who were on the borderline were considered as pigs. Many of you, some of you will certainly remember, that I look around, many of you are Medicare alumni like I am. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the question of were you loyal, this came up again and again. Martin Kamen, the discoverer of carbon-14, was had a lot of a rough time to find their job before they'd been accused of his political affiliations. The Cincinnati baseball team, which was the Cincinnati Reds, Reds? <laughs> um, they changed their name, Cincinnati Reds. This went on for a few years. So a witness was um, brought before the House Committee and was asked, also I think, in the baseball, whether they knew Red Changes. Do you realize what it means, Red Changes? So this is the climate within which Fowler and Bauer were going around giving talks. In May of 1957, not too many uh, months after the election, May of 57, through Barry Commoner and Ed Condon, come back to him, an invitation was given to Linus Pauling, who had won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry later for peak, excuse me, for peace studies as well. Pauling spoke at Washington campus and drew attention also to the fallout issue. After Pauling's lecture, he and Barry Commoner and Ed Condon got together and put together what is known as the Pauling Petition. They invited prominent scientists to sign this, urging the United States government, all governments, to quit testing nuclear weapons. And that went on to 1963, and by that time there was enough public concern about nuclear weapons testing that the pressure on politicians was such that the limited test ban treaty was agreed to in 1963, Kennedy signed it, and that was just a few months before he was assassinated. Now, 45 to 63 is a long time, and that's the period in which CNI started and did, I think, its most important work. Let me run through a few slides if we can get them. Okay. 1945 to 63. Bombs detonating, and then in 63, there's Kennedy signing the agreement. This is a diagram which turned up in the New York Times in 1962, and it shows a typical fallout pattern and through the Midwest and through the lower parts of the Midwest, that is the peak of where this fallout went. Um, St. Louis was favored. It was one of the hottest radioactive areas in the country. And that's what drew a lot of attention to it. So that Fowler and Bauer, two of the founders of the Committee for Nuclear Information, like Condon, members of the Quakers, felt a strong need for the scientists to get out and explain what was going on. The involvement of scientists was not new. That started in 1945 in Chicago, uh, people in the bomb project. Cole Morrison, one of the major scientists, but also involved in the bomb project, tried to organize opinion against even the use of the nuclear weapons for military purposes. They were the ones who were debating, should there be a peaceful demonstration of what could happen if Japan didn't concede and, admit and get, excuse me, was defeated. Um, that didn't happen, the bombs were used, and the graphic pictures of bombs and the effects of people being fried um, had a major effect. But that's part of the background. There was already a concern amongst the scientists. And the, 
what you see over here is the fallout, and the, the intensity of the fallout of St. Louis was quite marked. The St. Louis County Health Department, after a certain time, began to monitor the strontium content in milk, and they had bands one, two, and three, and got to level three, which was more than 100 pesos per liter. They notified us, the Committee for Nuclear Information, we notified area pediatricians, and the advice of the pediatricians, or many of them did, was to tell patients, put your children on to dry milk. By that way, you've got the milk, the dry milk, which has been stored for a while, has not been contaminated by strontium, you can reduce the exposure. Our daughter was born in August of 1960, we put on to dry milk for about six months. But in one way. How do you get rid of iodine? Iodine 131 is part of the fallout also. And the pediatricians who suggested that what you should do is to drink a lot of cough medicine, which has a lot of iodine in it. So people were doing all sorts of things to try to minimize the uptake of strontium. I must pause and comment over here. At the time, there was a big debate going on. What is the effect through radioactive material, where there are very small doses, what is the biological effect on living tissue, mainly us? And the answer is it wasn't well known, wasn't well established. Alice Stewart and Ian done some pioneering work. Was the effect, the biological effect, strictly proportional to how much you ingested, or was there what was called a threshold? In other words, if you absorbed in the body a certain amount of strontium or iodine, the body could repair itself. There was a repair mechanism not fully understood. And it was only when you exceeded what was called a threshold that the, serious, that the effects could be serious. We didn't take any position on that. We just simply said, we don't know. The conservative position is that there's a straight line, a linear relation. And if you go on that basis, then the accumulation of small doses, if testing continued, and that's a provision which is often left out in the discussions these days, if testing continued or accelerated, then people would be exposed to a brain radiation dose. And I must caution you here. Joe is an enthusiast. There has been heavy criticism of the work that's come out of Joe's group with the he and his associates. The criticism is statistical, methodological, epidemiological. Um, many people who are professionally involved, they do not accept the projected results of how many deaths or how many cancer cases. We're not going to sort that out tonight, but I felt I had to make mention of it. Let me go on and look at some of the slides. Obviously, we have these. I have one of the original buttons left. I couldn't find the other one. Um, they're cute. Um, they made the point. If you give your tooth to science, you get rewarded as something of a souvenir. And there were all sorts of volunteers, many volunteers, not scientists, did the, the slave work, filling out cards of as much background information as we could about teeth, classifying the type of teeth, teeth. Over 300,000 collected, of which 85,000 survived, to be used by Joe and Garno's project more recently. Um, my daughter wrote a note to the Tooth Theory. Um, you can probably read it. <laughs> to the Tooth Theory, I've decided to invite you to tea on Sunday. Then, will you please, will you please wear your everyday clothes with your uniform underneath? Um, my tooth is here. Love, Rachel Jean, pre to the Tooth Theory. My phone number is, and there it was. So <laughs> So we have that. Now the work of classifying these teeth was quite onerous. And you can see the people gathered over here to sort out the teeth and catalog <laughs> The early papers, one of the earliest papers, as well as Louise Rees, who passed away within the last year or so. Um, Louise was the director of the project, and here's a paper from Science Magazine, one of the premier science. I'm watching like you Are you? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, Louise wrote one of the major papers. There was another paper, Carl Rosenthal and others, including John Bird, who later was the dean of the School of Dental Medicine, which we still have. There were papers which reported this. Nature is one of the prime scientific journals, heavily refereed. It's a matter of prestige to be invited or to actually submit and have accepted the paper in Nature. Another paper is go on. We're not working this time again. Um, can we try and get some technical help? Um, can you apply the official to this?
Thank you. Okay, this is a graph from Hammer Rosenthal's paper. From Hammer Rosenthal's paper showing the increase in strontium. The statistics were lousy, but the qualitative point was made that after 1952, you see a pickup, 1954, things increased tremendously. Um, the statistics are poor, there weren't many teeth, but the general message came across, strontium was increasing, and that message was noted by the politicians. This is a map produced as uh, part of the major report of a few years ago from the National Academy, showing the distribution, in this case, um, radiation doses to the thyroid, accumulated from all exposures um, to all tests. And you can see Missouri is one of the hottest areas in the country. Um, to the north and west of us, there are other heavily for filled out areas. Um, but there's a lot more data of this kind. Major publicity in the Nation magazine, um, William Wine wrote a long, very good article on the baby teeth that attracted an enormous amount of attention. We were not the only group. The Committee of Nuclear, for Nuclear Information was formed in 58, but there were other groups in Colorado, in Minnesota, in New York. Um, none as well publicized. We had the only magazine. We had the baby tooth survey. Um, but still, there were many others active going out, giving talks, trying to educate the public. So there was a growing level of concern, not highly technical, but concerned generally of what could happen if the testing continued at anywhere near the current level. This is another uh, Burley graph showing the increase, this only up to 54, and it's just beginning to take off over there. The division here shows the difference between foreman and breastfed. really wasn't very much difference. Okay, what about local reactions? Well, um, here we have a picket, some of you will recognize Brookings Hall, and the avenue of trees which still goes down there. Um, the people in the community were very unhappy about Washington University and the role of the activists amongst the faculty going out and giving talks. Um, they were considered as supportive of the Soviet Union, which wasn't popular, and so there were pickets outside. Um, the reference here to Pauling was predicted to Pauling's speech on campus in 1957, but there, were, there was criticism as well. Some of you I'm old enough to remember that the St. Louis used to have two newspapers. The first dispatch was published in the evening or afternoon. The morning paper was the Globe Democrat, a very conservative paper, professionally run, but very conservative, highly critical of Washington Uni Uni University. Um, what I've treasured is copies of editorial from October 1960. So this is in the middle of this period we're talking about. The editorial has the headline, Glorification and Deceit. And the last sentence was, the co after criticizing the university, basically we're not firing faculty, we spoke out. Um, a great university, great St. Louis institution has been badly used, nor is it the first time, by a group which glorifies deceit and evasion in the outrageous guise of freedom of speech and conscience. They attacked us, this was the only one. What is unusual about this particular editorial, and it bears on according to the CNI and everything like that. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, Ted Rosebery, the School of Medicine, um, very left-wing politics, which is, is right. He went to Union Station to meet a friend of his, Herbert Apte, who was secretary of the US Communist Party. That spread all over the newspapers. So the Globe was advocating in the editor and others that Rosebery should be fired. The university wasn't doing that. In response to that editorial, there was a letter to the editor from Ethan Shepley. Ethan Shepley was the Chancellor of Washington University. A very conservative man politically, a man of extraordinary decency. And he straightened out the Globe Democrat. Um, he, <coughs> just quoting briefly over here, this suggests a misunderstanding of the fundamental principles of academic freedom. We will continue to defend the faculty's right to speak, and in doing so, we are acting in the best traditions of academic freedom by Ethan Shepley. People couldn't speak out unless they felt that they were being protected, that their jobs were not going to be threatened. That isn't always the case. Um, if we had time, I would spend a while talking about other projects that the Atomic Energy Commission was then was. The ADC wanted to test nuclear weapons, the, excuse me, the Test Ban Treaty of 1963 did not rule out underground um, explosions. The idea was this could be used for civil engineering purposes. You would blow a mountain out of the way if it was in your way. As Edward Teller said, you want a mountain move? 
send me a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had projects to have a major excavation. There was a plan to double the Campanile Canal. That fell through. There were all sorts of other um, projects. And then there was a project to do some digging in Alaska <clears throat> to create a harbor. And some environmentalists there had done a study, and they showed that if there was that project, a lot of the fallout would come to Earth and be eaten by caribou. Caribou is an important part of the diet of Eskimos. And what they showed was that the caribou antlers were radioactive. They absorbed it. From the Soviet tests, already there was enough radioactive material being absorbed. And that killed that project. This was called Project Sunshine Project. Harvard, um, Chariot Project. This whole program gradually got wiped out because of concern. Not because there was yet a risk to people, but a concern that they could ultimately be. People could not speak out like that unless they had some protection. In Alaska, they didn't. Two of those scientists got fired. Thirty years later, they were given honorary PhDs. Um, it took a while, and politics changed. So, the lesson that I personally draw is having come here in 56, as we mentioned, to a very, very raw faculty member, is that scientists, I think, have obligations. Where you are studying, or can study, and can interpret complex technical issues for the general public, then the scientists have an obligation. And I wish that more of my colleagues nationally would be doing this. There are many issues, global warming, pollution, you can think of all sorts of other issues. You need the protection that a university can provide. And I think this is one of the points that I said you come away with, and I hope that you do too, that the Committee for Nuclear Information was a symbol of that freedom, also a symbol of the obligation that many people felt. Well, I've covered probably a few more minutes today than expected. Let me pause now, and we'll come back to some of this when you have questions. Thank you. Almost 74 years ago, 
Albert Einstein proclaimed, uranium may be turned into a new and important source of energy. This statement, coming on the heels of research by Enrico Fermi and other noted physicists, modern science was on the verge of the first nuclear reaction from the fission of uranium. Less than three years later, World War II underway, the past of atomic science and Malakrat merged, creating a watershed in American history. For Malakrat, this memorable era began with a staggering challenge from the then Chancellor of Washington University, Dr. Arthur Holly Compton, which we have all seen a picture of recently. Dr. Compton asked Ed Malakrat Jr. to sign into a top secret project to purify large quantities of uranium compounds in a remarkably short period of time, all is shrouded in secrecy. Dr. Compton and his team are working at the behest of the government, the National Defense Research Committee, and Ed Malaprat Jr. agrees and signs on. The project formally began on April 24, 1942. By July of 42, Malaprat was producing tonnage amounts of uranium for delivery to the University of Chicago. July of 43, Malakrop begins processing thorium, tolerant, and other products associated with nuclear weapons. 43 to 45, workers are told that they are performing a patriotic duty. This is all still shrouded in secrecy. Uh, Dr. Freelander just spoke of the Globe Democrat. This is actually a huge book that I have with uh, Globe Democrat articles in it. And this actually shows an article or an advertisement for workers. And you'll notice no special skill required for chemical operations 48 hour week on war work. Um, I just found it really astounding. And as you'll notice in, in some of these old articles, you'll see Mel Kraut was actually asking for workers. This is a photo of, of some of the former Mel Kraut employees. Mellencrot continued processing and was thrust into the forefront of the Manhattan Project or the Manhattan Engineering District, MED. All of the uranium that went into the first self-sustaining nuclear reaction under Stag Field was produced by Mellencrot. It astounds me how many people across this nation are not aware of that. There are over 390 facilities across the United States that did work for the Atomic Energy Commission. And you'll find things about Brookhaven National Lab, You'll find things about Nevada test site, um, Lindy ceramics, but it seems like Mellencroft for some reason was just so shrouded in secrecy that it was really difficult to, to hear a lot about it. This is the picture, a picture of Stag Field. August 6, 1945 at 8.16 a.m. Japanese time, an American B-29 bomber, the Enola Bay, drops the world's first atom bomb over Japan. 80,000 people are killed as a direct result of the blast and another 35,000 are injured. At least another 60,000 would be dead by the end of the year from the effects of the fallout. I just think it's mind-blowing to even look at it. August 1945, Mellon workers are given the day off in a medal. Um, my granddaughter, uh, I think she by K, she's over by K, dry. Um, Chrissy actually has, uh, I believe on her backpack, um, you all can see it when you get an opportunity, uh, a replica of the bomb pin that was actually handed out. It says A on it. It's a, a copy of that pin, a replica of it that was handed out to the workers in 1945. She also has a card that actually tells a little bit about it. Are you going to hold it up? And so everybody can actually take a look at that later. It's um, something that I had made in the Department of Energy had us actually assisted with. And we handed those out to many of the former workers at what we call our National Day of Remembrance. It's always held on October 30th. Told for the first time that they were processing the materials for the bomb, and that too was in 1945. They were still using cold words such as tubaloy, green salt, biscuit, and juice. Workers could not use or were never told the word uranium. Everything, again, was still shrouded in secrecy. That is a copy of the, the original pen that was handed out. The destruction that was unleashed by the atomic bomb dropped on Japan created an atmosphere of uncertainty about the future of nuclear power. In 1947, Congress established the Atomic Energy Commission to assume responsibility for the nation's planning and development of nuclear energy. 
Mellon Pond eventually had three separate facilities in Missouri, St. Louis, Weldon Spring, and Hematite. Mellon role in building this arsenal expanded to include a decade of production in St. Louis, uranium waste disposal, and another decade of production at Weldon Spring and a nuclear facility in Hematite. In his rush to build this atomic pile, Mellon has left a legacy of waste, residual radiation, contamination, and human tragedy. Mellon crop workers, especially in the early years, are known to be some of the most highly exposed in the entire history of the Atomic Energy Commission. I have actually internal memos and documents that will actually confirm that. More than 50 identified individuals from Mellon crop alone are known to have worked long enough in appalling concentrations of alpha-emitting radioactive dust to accumulate more than a permissible lifetime inhalation exposure. This is just one of the many documents that I have um, talking about some of the workers that were so highly exposed. I've actually brought some documents with me. I, I only have about 10 copies of each, but um, if you want additional copies, I'm sure we can get those to you. In an oral history of Merrill Eisenbeck conducted January 26, 1995 by the United States Department of Energy, Office of Human Radiation Experiments, May 1995, Eisenbeck states that Mellencron and Harshaw were two of the worst plants. These were designed to operate for 60 days but continued on for years. Eisenbeck states that he believes that the maximum amount of uranium in the air was supposed to be 50 micrograms per cubic meter. They were measuring milligrams per cubic meter. Mellon workers were excreting as much as a milligram a day in their urine. And this is just a, a copy of, of that oral history. I always found this one quite interesting, and it's, it's very small for me to read here, so bear with me. And I'm just not going to read the entire thing, but I just want to give you a, a gist of this. This is dated January 31st, 1951. About a year ago, you asked if it would be possible for us to estimate our potential liability among the long-term Mellon Crown employees. As I explained at that time, you presented a rather naughty problem, one which, in the state of our present knowledge, would probably not be answered even to a first approximation. Bob Alvarez, an Institute for Policy Studies senior scholar, served as senior policy advisor to the Energy Department Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment from 1993 to 1999. Uh, he wrote The Risk of Making Nuclear Weapons, a review of the health and mortality experience of U.S. DOE workers, January 2000. Mr. Alvarez states that Malaprow workers who processed uranium between 1942 and 1966 were found to have significant increased death rate from all cancers, 10% higher, respiratory diseases, chronic nephritis or kidney disease, 218%, and lymphatic cancers significantly elevated, significantly increased risk for cancers of the esophagus, 40%, rectum, 40% higher, pancreas, 31% higher, larynx, 36% higher, kidney, 34% higher, multiple myeloma, 33% higher. The Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act, um, nuclear weapons production and testing involve unique dangers. And over the past 20 years, more than two dozen scientific findings have emerged that indicate that certain of such employees are experiencing increased, experiencing increased risk of dying from cancer and non-malignant diseases. In the year 2000, Congress, on a bipartisan basis, enacted the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. That act is to compensate workers, or in many cases, their surviving family members, um, workers who were exposed uh, from their work in the nation's nuclear weapons industry. Mellon Crot um, was one of the 390 plus facilities across the United States that was involved in this type of work. And in 2000, when Congress enacted this piece of legislation, it was done so because the then Secretary of Energy, Energy Bill Richardson, had actually stated publicly that our nation had put workers in harm's way without their knowledge, without their protection, uh, without proper protection, 
and um, without their consent. That precipitated this law to be enacted. Mellencroft, um, like I said, produced a tiny amount of uranium and did not seem to um, be in the big scheme of things with the program originally. My parents were workers before I was ever born. Um, they worked, my father worked as a chemical operator starting in 1945. He worked for about 15 years. My mother was in the lab for about a year. Um, I, I don't remember a whole lot about my father. I actually learned more from the program I was in. But when I actually heard about the program, it was July or uh, we were able to file a claim, I'm sorry, July of 2001. And just through research, I was able to uncover about 12,000 documents. A lot of that was because of Kay Dry. Um, Kay Dry is amazing, and she really was my mentor. Um, throughout this process, though, at the original enactment of the law, I found that four sites were legislated in as what we call special exposure cohort sites. They were legislated in because they had very good, strong congressional delegation. And basically what that means is that these four sites, people that worked there for at least one full work year, 250 days, and had at least one of a list of 22 cancers, were considered automatic payments. That means that if the worker was living, they could receive up to $400,000 tax-free money and medical benefits uh, on top of that monetary uh, compensation. Mellon Pratt employees, as well as the remaining facility folks outside of those four areas, had to go through something called dose reconstruction. And basically, that's just a recreation of what those workers may have been exposed to. They look at their cancer, they look at when they were diagnosed versus the, the start date of their exposure. They would look for um, dosimeter readings, their, badge, their badges, or perhaps their um, urinalyses. And then they would get this dose reconstruction. Well, as I began to research this, um, through the process of making a lot of racket, what do you know, my mom was the first payment out. Um, she went through the dose reconstruction uh, for my father's cancer, and they paid her $150,000 for his cancer, $125,000 for his death, and then I think another twenty-five or $50,000 for wage loss. But by that time, I was so angry and sick over the things I was learning. I had workers' cases being denied. And what I found through the documents was that Mellencroft was purposely altering the records. One of the documents I brought with me tonight talks about, this poses a unique opportunity to conduct a clinical experiment on never such a widely exposed population. They were actually putting in zeros when they looked at the badges once they finally started monitoring the workers. Um, they were altering their urinalyses. So they said, you know, Pending uh, elimination of these horrible exposures, we're going to go ahead and experiment on these folks. So I found a loophole in the law, and that loophole allowed me to apply for that special exposure cohort, cohort that those first four sites had. I actually um, made it through the Senate on a unanimous vote, but it died in conference. Um, and then I actually filed a petition, and Mellencroft was or is the first facility in the history of the United States to actually win or become part of that special exposure cohort. And because that petition was approved, I was able to get compensation in over $200 million for those workers. It is now over $9 billion nationwide that has been paid out to these workers. So, Every day, I love my job. I'm so blessed because I'm actually able to get up in the morning, not even have to get dressed up. I can do it right in my own office at my own house and talk to folks. And I probably get about 80 to 100 calls a day from people all across the United States. We've actually had 90 special exposure cohorts go in since my first petition. And I'm able to help folks file those. Um, I appeal cases that have been denied. And it's just amazing to me how many of these facilities were out there and how many hundreds of thousands of people have been affected by this waste, this, this radioactive waste, and continue to be affected. Um, I, again, I had such a tough act to follow. I thank you for listening to me, and um, I'll go ahead and close now in case there's anything further we can follow.
take the screen up and uh, if Michael could resume the stage as well as Denise and, and sit at this table back here and we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, it's your opportunity to um, talk with these folks about uh, uh, this very special part of uh, St. Louis' history. We're going to find some of those. Would you like to take a seat? So, let's see if I can get the drill back. Um, we'll, um, so, he, he can hear us, right? Yes, David. Ah, oh, very good. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're here uh, with the audience for a few minutes to uh, take questions and, and comments. Um, if, if people will uh, raise their hand, I'll call on you. And, uh, I'll restate the question if necessary. People need to hear it. I can see, I can see you. What's the half-life of Strunkian 90? The half-life of Strunkian 90? Uh, it's, it's 29 years, but you can tell us more about that. That's not 29 years. And what does that mean? Uh, Strunkian, the, all radioactive substances, all, many uh, what are called fundamental particles, um, are radioactive. They will decay and with characteristic times. The half-life is how long does it take before 50% of the original number have changed. So you have 50% at the end of that time, you're down to 50% and of those, 25% would decay in the next half-life and so on it goes. So 29 years is enough to be absorbed, to be around long enough to do damage. Iodine 131, which some of us mentioned, has an eight-day half-life. So it's in and out, it can do damage, but it's in and out much more quickly. Thank you. Um, can I follow up and ask a question about what is iodine, uh, the iodine isotope you mentioned? Uh, it, is it, how is it, is it born and fall out the same way? Yes, it's part of the fallout, it gets absorbed. Um, the predominant place for being absorbed is thyroid, and that's what we're going to look for. There'd be an allegation of a large number of cases of leukemia, that's being argued about. Right, thanks. Uh, Ma'am, middle there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They showed that map where um, because of the Soviet testing, there was fallout in the United States. It was very concentrated. Um, it looked like, like from Iowa on down to Arkansas. Can you please explain how it ended up in the middle of the United States if the Soviet Union is over closer to Washington State? Well, it's a matter of the, the patterns of the winds. The winds will go in different directions, different altitudes. And so for any particular explosion, let's say from Las Vegas, from the Nevada test site, or from the Soviet Union, it's a question of which way are the winds blowing on that particular day. Let me take one moment to expand on something. Um, the AEC had a project for excavating a harbor in Alaska. The idea was um, choose a part where by creating a channel and then a basin, you could have all weather access, which would be wonderful. The trouble is they chose a place called the Okatura Creek. Sounds fine. Um, and they plan to have um, four blasts, one after the other, um, each one about more than twice the size of those used in Japan, and then a gigantic 200 kiloton um, explosion and another one to create a, a basin. That particular creek, unfortunately, um, was extraordinarily windy. And it was so windy that the snow was blown off Clear snow, simply cleared away, and the rocks were exposed during the winter months. Any fallout would fall on the rocks. There were no, um, no general um, snow cover to protect them at all. The rocks, however, were covered with lichens, natural vegetation. Lichens are strange, no root structure. They absorb the nourishment from the air. The caribou migrate because they know that there's lichens on the exposed rocks, and the caribou migrate here during the winter months because that's where they can get feeding. The Eskimos, however, um, feed on the, on the caribou. And so, um, the CNI magazine describing all of this was caribou legend has it by dog sled all over there, an enormous pressure. I was flown up to the Alaskan Legislative Council to testify, this is in late 1969, on the effect of nuclear weapons like that. The Alaskan Legislature is not happy. Um, but the, what it points to is that the Fallout, which came from the Soviet tests, was concentrated by and large in the Arctic Circle in those regions. And a lot depends, as you asked originally, which direction does the wind go? 
you have to follow. So the organization from one test to another. Thank you. Uh, question here? Yes. When you're starting with uranium and that when in your fission you have what are called fission products. So smaller nuclei, all sorts of sizes and shapes, but um, sort of 50% or sometimes more than that um, of a uranium nucleus and many smaller fragments as well. Um, I don't remember offhand, um, both are used and you get fragments all over. Um, they're all, they're very different half lives, many are very short lived, so no, no particular interest, but um, a wide range of nuclei. They assumed that there was so much overexposure that they just gave them automatic compensation. And that was if they worked there at least a full year. And there really is no scientific rhyme or reason for that. That was just something that was put into Congress. They said 250 days, a full work year, and then the one of 22 cancers. Um, and there are a few left out, like prostate cancer, skin cancers, um, uterine cancer. But if you had one of those 22, causations assumed that it's an automatic payment. And I have documents showing where Mellicott was actually having, I think they had a five-man crew out actually looking in areas surrounding the St. Louis area to see just how much atmospheric, uh, wouldn't even be fallout, atmospheric radiation was actually getting out in the nearby area. Um, and there were maps showing that as well as looking at um, autopsies without consent to see what was going into the bone and into the kidneys. Um, so it's pretty barbaric, actually. One more question, and, and speak up so that people can come back in here, too. And this question is for Joe. Um, I'm wondering if in his studies with the 85,000 baby teeth that were passed on, um, has he taken a deeper dive into where within the St. Louis area they're seeing the concentration? So Joe, there's a question for you about the uh, 85,000 uh, teeth that remain to study. Um, have you taken a deeper look at uh, the concentration within the St. Louis area? Is that is that yes. fairly statement? No, no, we haven't. No, nor I believe was that done in the original study. Right, um, but the addresses are there on the cards. But the addresses are there on the cards. Uh, is there yes, something the that could, could be done? Is there something that could be done? Yes, the addresses are there on the cards and codes. Uh, it, it's certainly possible. May I um, interrupt there? I'm sorry. I have to disagree. Um, the address is on the card, and Joe has done a massive amount of detective work trying to track down people. But the exposure to the strontium is via the milk, and the milk comes from, I don't know, half a dozen different dairies. Yes. So it's unlikely that the milk from the P2 
people in New City or Clayton or Rowview Gardens would necessarily come from different areas. And so trying to pin down where did the milk come from would be much harder, probably impossible. Well, except that a lot of the milk was produced came from southwest Missouri, which is where the rain came down, and then that may have been sold under different labels. But I don't think it's going to be possible to reconstruct who in this area of St. Louis, whether it's in the city or in Kirkwood or wherever it is, um, got more radiation. I don't think that would be easy to do and it would be open to a good deal of challenge. Michael, um, I, I wondered, I haven't looked at this myself, but the um, the assumption was always about cow's milk, how mother's milk was also affected, and, 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 and is there any, anything you'd say about that? Uh, I don't know whether that's been looked at, and Joe may have a comment on it. I think I, I, yes, I can make one comment. One thing the uh, original St. Louis study found was uh, babies who were breastfed at least six months had much less strontium-90 in their teeth than babies who were bottled fed, something like 30 or 40 percent less. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems you run into is excuse me, statistics. Do you have enough to make it plausible and statistically significant results? Well, what if the mother worked at Malacrot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, another question from the back, the men yeah. in black, the black shirt, actually. No, uh, okay. the black shirt. Oh, okay, got it. Um, well, this is, this is great, it's very informative. I'm a 66-year-old one-time tooth donor. And yes, I put my feet in the x-ray machine at the shoe store, uh, and for a dreadfully long time, no doubt. But um, regarding the effect on thyroids in particular, uh, I have hypothyroidism, so I take a supplement to make my thyroid do what it should. But I'm healthy, I don't have fatigue, I'm not overweight. Um, so, specifically, the effect on thyroids, I mean, I've heard, you know, cancer and all of this, it's been very informative. So, is there a connection, hyper versus hypothyroidism, anything there? The can, can, I, can I at least take that so Joe can hear uh, Is there a connection with, uh, between uh, this exposure and uh, potential exposure and, and, and uh, hypo, hyperthyroidism? That, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, uh, not so much with the strontium, but there is a connection between hypothyroidism and radioactive iodine. And the first uh, instance where that was found was in the populations living in the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. In addition to Nevada, uh, the United States also tested bombs in the South Pacific as well. And there were um, documented cases of um, babies who were born with severe hypothyroidism, and it's it's really uh, it's it's a disease that can be treated now with artificial thyroid, but those babies weren't treated. Uh, they were actually called cretins um, because they grew up to be dwarfs and uh, also very mentally retarded. So yes, there is a connection between the two. I think one of the problems here is differentiating between individual cases and large numbers of people. Um, there are people who contract lung cancer who have never smoked. And one has to be awfully cautious in the application of statistics, how you calculate this, what are the random chances and so on. Some people who inhale um, iodine will get cancer, but the people who get cancer have nothing to do with iodine. And has to be very careful, and that has to be built into the analysis. Thank you. Another question. Uh, yellow shirt, white, white shirt? Yeah, uh, I, this is for Joe. I'm just curious what the future of the baby teeth study looks like with his organization. Sort of timeline and scope of study. Um, the, the future of the tooth study is to do more health studies. The first one that we did that I mentioned in 2010 looked only at a sample of males from St. Louis born 
1959, 60, and 61. Um, we have several ways we could uh, build on this. We could do more males from these years or in other years. We could do females, although they're tougher to track down because they change their name when, when they get married. Um, the, as far as a timeline, I'm, I'm sorry to say that the big uh, obstacle here is uh, the ability to raise funds to support this kind of research. Uh, the government isn't very um, interested in, in uh, rehashing some of the, the dirty laundry of, of years ago and the, uh, what, what it did to people and uh, even even private uh, sources. Um, I, I think a lot of groups think of this as something that happened years ago um, and it doesn't have any current relevance. Well, well it certainly does, but uh, you know, we, as, as soon as we can um, get enough, we are going to build on this study and encourage others to do the same. A couple more questions. Uh, this woman over here on the end. Uh, I was wondering, being a baby tooth donor at the time, the teeth that were found, is there a database where we can go in and see, give them our new name and tell them our health history since then? Joking here now? Uh, not really. The baby tooth that were found, I missed the rest. Um, is there a database that uh, allows uh, a person to um, uh, collate their, their own current information with, um, with um, the original uh, baby teeth that were donated? Is that right? Right. We, we wish. Um, since the teeth were found and donated to our group, uh, we have been looking for some good soul or, or good souls to sit down and go through the, the hideous job of entering 85,000, information on 85,000 uh, tooth donors. As it turns out for our first study, uh, I myself did, did 6,300, uh, which is a start, but the, the process is very long and, and dirty and, and difficult, but um, that, that, is, that is certainly, uh, real, really if we had all the money in the world, that would be the first step we would do. Excuse me, I think that's a very good question. It's very difficult to do. The absence of really secure funding is what gets in the way. It's one of the reasons Washington U didn't do anything when the teeth were found. Um, if, they, if Joe finds the tooth, I suspect he'd be willing to give it back to you. <laughs> Check with your dentist. Uh, in the half here. Uh, my question is this. Uh, uh, Dr. Freeland, you suggested uh, that the industry tends to protect itself. Um, and also, recently, we had the Fukushima disaster. Watching that, um, I watched a lot of a lot of outlets, and and they never seem to mention radioactivity particles. They seem to concentrate. And, and the topic regarding radiation seems to be one of the gamma rays, the, the electromagnetic radiation. There doesn't seem to be much discussion in the media in the U.S. about these uh, uh, biologically active, uh, you know, fallout which uh, can be absorbed. I was wondering, do you think, maybe I'm overly sensitive to it, but are we more or less limited now than we were then about such types of radiation? Can everybody hear that in the back? No. Okay. The question was, are we more or less literate now about radiation? You know, given that we are um, kind of a nerd to things like uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl and not, not really paying attention to what's uh, what might be happening throughout the world. Is that right, Steve? Well, yeah, and, and basically, you know, it just seems like all the time, I just always remember Sunday who was talking about the effects of radiation. Nothing to worry about. My, 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 my mm -hmm. dad, which was reading all the gamma radiation, which mm -hmm. doesn't stick around, doesn't remain. I mean, mm -hmm. two, two parts. Are we less or more literate? But also, uh, is, do you think that, that, that uh, there's been a fair coverage Second part of this question was, is there fair coverage of, of, of these nuclear accidents and uh, are they really measuring everything that they might measure? I hate to say it, but the level of scientific information in the general media is not very high. Um, most people don't have much contact with that. I wish it were better. Um, could that be taught in the schools? I wish it were. Um, it could bring in some very important ideas. 
the radiation is so loosely spoken of, and one should really break it down. When this has been discovered 100 years or so ago, they didn't know what these radiations were. They named them the part of the Greek country. Excuse me, alpha, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha are the nuclei of helium, the beta are electrons, and the gamma was everything else, x-rays and high-energy x-rays. These don't tend to go very far in here. The range of the alpha, the alpha particle from radium or uranium is around 25 microns, a thousand of an inch. So if you put a radioactive material here from radium, it's not going to go very far, it doesn't penetrate. It's got to be absorbed chemically and go to the place where it shouldn't be. It really produces the electrons, don't travel any distance at all except very, very locally. Um, but when you have a large cloud of dirt from an explosion coming along, and the half-life is either 29 years or even eight days, that can get somewhere, be absorbed and do the damage. But the basic ideas of radiation and radiation damage could be fitted into a school, a science curriculum. I think it would add some currency, some relevance. I wish the science curricula were more imaginative than they are. Things have been dumped where it wasn't even necessarily Mallinckrodt, but a privately owned for profit company that actually dumped illegally at Westlake Landfill. Um, and then we have issues where Cold Water Creek folks have been affected as well. And there are attorneys that have filed suit. Um, outside of the Mallinckrodt area, we have, uh, I believe it is Apollo and Park sites uh, in Pennsylvania. There have been um, litigation that has went on there that they have been successful with. So I, I guess it just depends on who the injured party is. Um, but I think for the most part, what I've seen is they've been given a whole harmless agreement. And I think this piece of legislation went in 
due to lawsuits being filed, and I think that the thought was this would be quicker. Um, it's a set of money that's put aside. It's considered an entitlement program, um, an apology payment, if you will, and that's supposed to stop the lawsuits. And, you know, many people, for example, like my mom was given that set of money, and even with the program I'm in, you would see people say, oh, well, they're getting the money, or what if we paid somebody that didn't deserve it? You can ask anybody, any one of those workers, would you rather have your health or that money? They're going to tell you, I want my health. And believe me, they can bleed through that money lickety split. And the same thing, would you rather have your loved one or would you rather have the one hundred fifty to $400,000? And um, to me, the companies have actually got away with, gotten away with murder because that's what I think this was. When the documents I look at, they purposely expose these workers, overexpose them, knew they were doing it under the guise of national welfare, although after the bomb was dropped, they kept doing it. And then we're conducting autopsies without consent. And just, it's appalling to me. Um, one more question. I know we could go on tonight and maybe some of our panelists could stick around um, for later and, and uh, follow up. But uh, the gentleman here in the, in the tan okay. shirt. At what point did uh, people understand that this stuff was really dangerous? Okay, what year did people understand that uh, this radiation was really bad news? What, what year did people come to understand that radiation is dangerous? Yes. Um, I don't think you, I don't know that you can pin it on a particular date. I think to go back and look at the history of the Committee for Nuclear Information and the Radio Survey, what had been um, demonstrated was radioactive material from weapon tests was being absorbed. It could produce um, really serious health effects especially if it continued at the present level, or even worse. That produced a political pressure, so the David Tooth Survey never got the stage of seeing horrendous um, dosages which would, can be tied immediately with some sort of cancer or some other bad health effect. I don't know that there's a particular date. I think, by and large, what's happened is that the community, doctors, scientists, have realized that you want to, as Byron mentioned, minimize the amount of radiation. There's a government report which comes out every few years called the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, BIR. So BIR-7 came out a few years ago from the National Academy. And that summarizes with expert panels what the current state of information and understanding is. That's been a good source. Um, I don't think you can pin a particular date. I think there's a gradual recognition you want to minimize the amount of radiation and how you do it. You attack very different ways different solutions to different parts of the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give some thanks to our panel. Please. We really appreciate being here tonight and all of our audience and thank you for all your good questions. Um, well, thank you. So,